want to start uh, with Mark because Mark uh, probably was the first of everybody here to be on the on the music charts, at least, with the yes, Raiders. Yes, 61, right. 62. <laughs> Tell us about those early days uh, when you first... Now, you weren't planning to be a musician or a superstar or a singer, were you? you were, what was your planned uh, vocation? Uh, uh, I was going to be a rocket scientist. Rocket scientist, okay. And then I found out you had to do a lot of math for that, so... Yeah. So the music thing became easier than math. So you I could just, be sitting in the Tesla right now, zooming I, across. <laughs> I'd be pretty cold. Yeah. So you you got into the into the Raiders. How did that work? How did that uh, happen for you? Uh, well, I, I won a talent show, so I left home at 15, figuring it would be very easy, and uh, hooked up with Raiders. Uh, actually, it was a group called the, De well, it was, there was no name. There was no name, just a bunch of guys, and then we became the Downbeats, then we became the Raiders, and then the rest, as they say, is history. But it was like an overnight success in about, oh, seven years. Yeah, most bands will tell you that, right? And, and even Mickey's career as an actor before that. So tell me about the, the, the moment that it happened for you and the band, and uh, were you guys writing hits and saying, this is gonna be, a, this is gonna be the one, and what was your inspiration? We, every, everybody in the, in, in the Portland area, in the Northwest, there was a song called Louie Louie. Right. And you had to do that song two or three nights, two or three times a night, or they'd walk out on you. So we got the bright idea of recording Louie Louie about the same time that the Kingsman, who was one, another band in Oregon, got the bright idea of recording Louie Louie, went the same studio, same engineer, same microphone, same everything, same week, and recorded Louis Louis. They both came out simultaneously. Their sold 600 copies, ours sold 6,000. And on the strength of that, CBS Records signed us up, so we were on our way. We thought. <laughs> But it's a nice version of that song. You guys did a very up-tempo, speed yeah, we, version. Yeah, we had the, pretty much the West Coast soda. But then, of course, when we got on Dick Clark's Where the Action Is, that's when yeah. it really happened. Television was like a precursor to MTV. Everybody saw us at once. Luckily, everybody liked us, and uh, there you go. Who's, whose idea was the uniforms, the, the whole thing? Uh, Revere and I are walking up the street in Portland, Oregon, getting some cleaning done. We walked past this costume shop, and here's these guys in revolutionary garb. And I went to point to Bruce and said, look, you know, that's the way that uh, the guys used to dress back in the day. We would look at each other and went, yeah. So we went in, rented them for one a concert. Uh, everybody liked them. We came back. They said, where's your outfits? So we figured, well, it was like Gorgeous George without the costume. Who, Gorgeous George, you know who Gorgeous George is. I they probably do. don't. A wrestler who was very flamboyant. <laughs> so, so we had a choice of wearing feathered boa bikinis or... Uh, the Raider outfits, we decided on the coats. That was a good choice. Now, did you, did you then give them to uh, Gary Puckett and the Union Gap? Well, well that, was the other side. That, was the, that was the other side of the coin in the Civil War. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I, think, I think it was just, uh, it was kind of a, uh, an era. Sergeant Pepper was out, and it was kind of like, hey, uniforms are cool, you know? So uh, I, I'm not sure how Gary got the idea, but you never know. All right, well, well, we'll ask him. He'll I didn't license Flower it, Power I know next that. Year. So, so tell us uh, about hearing your, your song on the radio. That, that must be exhilarating, right? You're like driving around waiting for it to happen. What was that oh, like? Oh, yeah. Well, of course, AM radio was the biggest thing. And I remember I went to a fortune teller. Revere and I both went to a fortune teller when in the beginning of the group. And we both made a wish. And my wish was to have a record in the top 100. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, that's, that's what I thought would be a success. And of course, uh, our first record I heard on the radio, it was like crazy. And then when the TV thing happened and you started getting a network radio or every, every town you roll into, you get to hear your, your songs. I mean, it was like heady stuff. It was like, you know, a, better than a dream come true. Right, awesome, fantastic. Mickey, welcome back. And I just got an email the other day that says, beginning in June, you're going to be back on tour with your lifelong friend, Mike Nesmith, and your first ever national tour as a duo. Can you give us a little information about that? Yeah, what absolutely. Uh, I'm very excited about it. But first of all, I do want to thank everybody for coming here today and to be in this illustrious uh, crowd. Uh, my mom was such a great fan of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> really. She loved you guys. How many times and have I heard that? Told me, she played me My your music. My grandmother really liked you guys. <laughs> she played all your music for me. It was Was really it back great. on the, the so, gramophone? So, yeah. 
Yeah, it's true. Uh, Nez and I got together a couple months ago and just thought, you know, why not? You know, um, we've done just about every other configuration, um, but it's called uh, Monkeys Present the Mike and Mickey Show. Okay. Um, because as Nez says, uh, it's the remnants of the monkeys. So. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm looking forward to it. I'm, you know, <laughs> well, it's like the grass root. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, uh, we've always uh, really enjoyed working together. Uh, we have similar tastes and musical tastes and, and com com comedic taste. And uh, so we're looking forward to it. It's going to be, a, I think it'll be a lot of fun. It's only uh, 16, 17 dates or something like that. But we'll see. What happens after that? Is it is it tough to get Mike off the farm and get him out to do something? It doesn't seem like he, he, just, he just loves yeah. to be out in nature. Yep. Well, that or in his Tesla. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was him. Okay. Uh, it is tough. You know, he um, it, he he tends to be sort of a solitary uh, soul and uh, always has been right mm -hmm. from the get go. Um, and he's o always been invited uh, into any of the uh, uh, the monkey endeavors. Um, and sometimes he's chosen to... He's kind of our um, Neil Young. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like that. <laughs> kind of that. That works, yes. for sure. <laughs> uh, and, and he sometimes chooses to, to, to join us, sometimes not, and it's fine, it's okay. Well, it's going to be fantastic. But this is great because he'll we'll be doing a lot of... Um, uh, uh, the stuff that he recorded, of course, uh, with and for the monkeys, and then post stuff, the uh, first national band stuff, and uh, you know it'll it'll be a lot of fun. He and I have a great blend mm -hmm. uh, vocally, always have, and uh, and of course we'll also be doing all the big monkey hits too. Of, you know, of course. Well, you know what would be cool since you have his ear, if you could invite him back on a future Flower Power cruise along with you, sell it. Make it big. I'll tell him. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Mickey, I was thinking about you. In, I live in Fort Lauderdale. I was thinking about you the other day. I went to a tavern, and uh, they... <laughs> well, there is that. No, but it, here's where I'm getting to. You guys interrupted me. And I actually took a picture. I have it on my phone. I'll show you later. A picture of an of a IPA called Monkey Boy. Circus Boy. I'm sorry. Circus oh, Boy. Oh, Circus Boy. Really? Circus Boy. Circus Boy You should beer. license that. Just a minute, I want to call my lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> Circus Boy. So uh, I thought of you immediately. I, I think I posted it on your Facebook page so that all your fans could appreciate it. But, oh, uh, cool. But anyway, I just thought of you. And that reminds me to ask you about, because before you became a, a, a superstar with the Monkees singer-songwriter, you were actually an actor, and you did a, a lot of presentations, a lot of, and you did a TV show. What made you... Well, first tell us about that early life and then how you... Transitioned into the monkeys. Well, the early life is pretty well known. My parents were both in showbiz. Um, and my father was an actor, singer. My mom was an actress. They met doing a play in Hollywood. Uh, so I grew up in this uh, showbiz family, not your typical sort of Hollywood Beverly Hills uh, type uh, uh, showbiz family. Uh, you know, eyes and teeth, honey. Eyes and teeth. Um, it was uh, really much more down to earth. We lived on a ranch in the valley and had horses and Elephants. you know stuff. So uh, the uh, the business I basically I followed in my father's footsteps. My first screen test I was six I think for wow. a movie that actually never got made. But um, and then the Circus Boy when I was ten. I actually have uh, some prenatal work coming out on ultrasound. <laughs> That's going to be nice. Yeah, it's good. Can it's you black make it and white, but it's still kind of... Um, so, yeah, I grew up in the business. I thought everybody's uh, father was an actor. I hadn't, you know... And then Circus Boy came along from his agent. My dad's agent just informally said, do you want to go to... a?" audition and I'd been to a couple and I was like yeah okay maybe not I got a baseball game I'm you know I almost didn't go and then of course that did change my life that was probably the biggest life-changing thing to do circus boy and then uh, after that I didn't do anything in the business for uh, years uh, until uh, the monkey audition and that was just again by almost coincidence I was 
I was studying to be an architect, as a matter of fact. See, we had a, a panel about that yesterday, about what our stars might have been. So you think there was a chance that you would have been? Oh, I was in, in a, a college doing architecture mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of years. Uh, and, uh, but I was also, you know, on the, in the summer break, I would, you know, do a guest shot on these local, you know, the uh, uh, TV shows like Mr. Novak and Peyton Place and, and you know, uh, TV, and it was mainly just to make money. I was gonna be an architect, and if I couldn't make it as an architect, I was gonna fall back on show business. <laughs> It's true. But in the back of your mind, you must have loved music because you were there listening to the Beatles on a, a watching them on Ed Sullivan on a little black and white TV on top of a van. I mean, you were really tuned in to pop culture and the British invasion and what was happening, right? Everybody that I knew was in a band. <laughs> Mine was Mickey and the One Nighters. <laughs> oh, because it was one night. <laughs> I was, I was, no, it was a cover band like everybody, like the Beatles started uh, out as a cover band. Um, uh, it was, I did, uh, I had a couple of bands, one called The Missing Links, believe it or not. This is pre-Monkeys. Uh, yeah, because I was, I could sing and, and I would go around town and play uh, and sing in uh, the local, uh, uh, you know, open mic night, you know, kind mm -hmm. of thing. And that's where the producers of the, of the Monkeys actually came and saw me singing Johnny Be Good, which ended up being my audition piece for the Monkeys. Uh, and yeah, when, when that it, uh, that year '65, uh, there were at least three or four uh, television shows that were focused on on uh, the contemporary pop rock music world. It was in the air. You know, mm -hmm. there was one that I was up for that I auditioned for uh, uh, about a Peter Paul and Mary kind of folk group. It actually got piloted, uh, didn't sell, but it was called The Happeners and. Uh, it actually did go to pilot, but didn't sell. Another one was like a Beach Boy kind of surfing band thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember the name of it. It did not go to pilot. I was up for that. And another one was like the New Christie Minstrel, Big Family, Mighty Wind, you know, kind of <laughs> uh, uh, group. Uh, it did not go to pilot. But then, then there was the Monkees, and I even then remember thinking this is. Different. This is very, very different. Did you think and it was an acting job or a singing job? Well, it was both. You had to be able to act, sing, and play an instrument. That was from the get-go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even to get into the auditions, uh, that was very clear. How did David get in the band? <laughs> oh, oh, he played tambourine. He w he was already signed to Screen Gems. <laughs> um, oh, the tambourine. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, no, you had to be able to sing. He's, he, he was a, a, a great singer. He'd done Broadway already, you know, uh, Oliver and all that. He was actually on that first Ed Sullivan show with the Beatles that He night. was. He I don't watching, remember he was him it from at the stage. All. all I remember is the Beatles. I don't remember him. But, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but you had to be able to sing and play and, and do comedy. And uh, the, the auditions were, uh, now in retrospect, a lot like you would audition for a musical, for a musical theater on Broadway. Uh, you have to have all those skills. Uh, Tap dancing? Well, yeah, a little bit. I mean, there was, there was, you know, movement. You had to be able to be funny. You had to be able to act, uh, do scenes. Scene study was one of the auditions. And this isn't like American Idol kind of, uh, you know, thing. This was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a sound stage. I've seen the line around the building. Were those people that had a yeah. reservation, or <laughs> did you have, you had an invite, right? No, I'd already had a series. So one had, go. when one has one's own series, one, <laughs> one does not go to the cattle call. Ah. <laughs> one has a private audition with the producer. So. <laughs> no, I'm, I... Uh, you know, I'd already had a bit of a name from being a kid. Same studio, same office. You know, when I did show up for the monkeys, the it was the same guard at the gate. <laughs> so ah. they, hey, Mickey, how you doing? Oh, you're back. Okay. Um, so, uh, it, but it was you know the monkeys essentially was uh, Marx Brothers musical on television. 
uh, for half an hour. I think that, that even the Beatles called you that. They, yes, they, yeah, 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 it was John that, you know, and, and he was absolutely right. I like them, they're like the Marx Brothers. It was much more about the Marx Brothers than the Beatles. Right. First of all, we were not famous, and we never were famous on the TV show. It was this struggle for success, trying to be the Beatles. That's what the show was about, about this band that wanted to be the Beatles. And we had a poster of, of the Beatles in the, on the set, in, in the, that uh, Malibu beach house, which does beg the question, how could we afford a Malibu <laughs> beach house when we never got any work? <laughs> and we would throw darts at it. <laughs> Uh, but that's what the show was about, and that's what The Monkees was about. Well, Sonny Crockett drove a Ferrari Testarossa on 22.5 a year in Miami, so <laughs> same kind of thing. So I, I know I'm jumping ahead here, but is it, did you actually, did I hear this, did you actually audition for the role of Fonzie? Is that true? It was down to me and Henry. You, it was down to end. you and Henry, and Henry yeah. Winkler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he tells a story. We became good friends uh, uh, later. He tells a story of going into the callback for the final, you know, I guess, audition, and it was me and him. And he walked in, and he saw me, and he said, ah, oh, shit, I'll never get this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he was perfect, obviously. You know, he was the Fonz. Uh, I, I, would, I would have been trying to pretend I was a, a East Coast motorcycle kind of, you know, uh, guy. He was the Fonz, and he was wonderful in the part, of course. Hey. We obviously know the, the monkeys had terrific success, but do you remember the moment when you heard uh, um, uh, Last Night to Clarksville, I guess would be the first single, on the, on the radio or some, like Mark yeah. was talking about? Can yeah. you give us that, what was happening in your nerves and your I heart? I absolutely remember. Well, I was not uh, au fait necessarily with the music industry. Uh, I was an actor and I, could, and I was a singer and I did live stuff, but I didn't actually know that much about the radio uh, record company, you know, whole thing. Tommy Boyce actually said to me years ago, uh, he said, I don't know if you remember, but I, I came up to you one day and I said, You're, you have three, three uh, songs in the top ten in Cashbox. And I said, what's Cashbox? <laughs> I had no idea. Uh, I do remember the first time I heard uh, Clarksville. Uh, Davey and I uh, were... Uh, co-renting a, a, a house in, in, uh, in L.A. Uh, in the early days and shooting the show every day and, you know, coming. And we were driving, we'd heard that the song was going to be uh, premiered on KHJ uh, mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah, legendary. And <clears throat> big station, uh, AM station uh, at the time, like Mark was saying, it was all about AM, AM radio. AM was king. Yeah. And we're driving home, we just had pulled up in front of the house and it came on the radio, and we just looked at each other and beamed, you know, we were just like, oh my goodness. That was the first time I heard, a, uh, I heard one of the songs on the radio, because we were ensconced in the, on the set every day, 10, 12 hours a day. We didn't get out much right. sequestered, you know, kind of. All right. Let's talk to Felix Cavallari, my buddy over here. What a show. Hello. Seen you many times, man. You always give 120 percent. You're amazing. And uh, tell me, uh, your I, and I was watching you on the All Access Pass with Jason, and you were talking about your classical influences. But when did it transition to rock and roll, or even almost? I don't know if you called Joey D doo wop, but certainly pre rock and roll music, right? Tell me about that period. You know, I want to ask Mickey a question. Oh, go yeah, question. right ahead, Felix. You know, we heard this story years ago that that you built a a, 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 a helicopter in a room. And that you, when you built it, it was all together. You couldn't get it out because the door was too small. <laughs> the urban myth. Oh, okay. Uh, you I don't build a helicopter. I just wanted to ask if you build a, you know. I did build. It was a gyrocopter. Gyrocopter, actually, yes. Which is slightly different. But you than, could get it out of the building. Yeah, of course. I, you don't <laughs> build. You don't build a gyrocopter. You know, sometimes and, you know and you have this. Not be able to get it out the, the door. News that you can't believe, but anyway, I I believed it. I did have to take the doors off. I thought so. But I had <laughs> planned all that. I mean, that's pretty simple I'm stuff. sorry about that. <laughs> Excuse me, now, what, oh. was the, what was my name? Well, I was going to say, <laughs> I guess you can strike that paragraph from the book. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, uh, beginning to rock and roll. Here's what happened to me. I'm a young, young fella. 
uh, who my mom uh, wanted me to be a classical musician. So uh, I said, well, okay, I'll tell you what, I'd rather play baseball. However, I wasn't really that good at baseball, <laughs> but, but I was good at playing the piano. So when I hit junior high, there was this gentleman in front of me, I use the word loosely, he became one of my best friends, and he turned around to me and he said, do you like rock and roll? I had never heard of rock and roll. But I said, yes, because, you know, come on, you gotta be cool in seventh grade, right? So I uh, immediately went home that evening and I turned on, uh, we had the good fortune in New York City of having Alan Freed. See, Alan Freed brought the, uh, uh, brought, brought the rock and roll idiom to, uh, to WINS. So I heard the very beginning of what we call, you know, American popular music now, which was phenomenal, and still is. And I guess that's why all you people are here, right? Because you got bitten by the same bug. So in American Rock and Roll, what, what type of song was it that you heard then? Well, I heard people like uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, Fats Domino, uh, you know, Smokey Robinson, Marvin Gaye. Uh, you know, I was a piano player. I heard Ray Charles playing piano. I said, well, what is this? Mm -hmm. This is like so cool, and, and it really uh, it was like epiphany, you know? I mean, I just, I really said, well, I can do this. I can play it, you know? And uh, that's really what started. And then how did you put that in action? What did you do? Well, what happened basically is there was a band uh, on, on the, in, this, in the school that was doing like weddings and bar mitzvahs and things like that and private parties, and they needed a piano player. So I went. And, uh, did you have a private audition, or did you have to go <laughs> stand in? They kidnapped me, what happened. <laughs> and uh, what happened basically is that, you know, now this is as, as the music was evolving, or that's, you know, to, uh, I guess, rock and roll. So in this middle of our show, I would do my little piece. You know, I'd do my little kind of like, come on over, baby, whole lot of shaking going on. Next thing I find out, Everybody's asking for that part of the show now. See, so we went from da 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 da. It was either that or have a nagila, have one, <laughs> one or the other. I can see the similarity. So that's what happened, and I kind of like you know I said, wow, this is fun. There's, you know, like there's a lot of reasons why this is fun, which we will not go into. <laughs> And then the magic of the, uh, the hit machine started when you joined the Rascals or you formed the Rascals with Eddie, is that right? Yeah, basically what happened is, you know, we had this lovely thing in those days called the draft. Oh, right. <laughs> and uh, I left school, I was in pre-med at Syracuse and I had a band up there and uh, I decided uh, one summer to go to work in the Catskill Mountains. How many of you remember the Catskills? Now you gotta understand this, I'm making $60 a week room and board. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> I loved it. Oh man, it was like, you know, I'm like, Mick, I, I was not brought up with show business. You know, my dad was a dentist, my mom was a pharmacist, you know, and uh, I said it at the thing the other day, you know, like my, when my dad was approached years later, he said, uh, do you know how much soul your son has? And my dad says, my souls are right here on my feet. That's <laughs> it. So, <laughs> So basically, I just loved it, and, and, and I, I really wanted to have an opportunity to uh, give it a try. And I was fortunate enough that my father, uh, he acquiesced, he said, like, take a year and see if you can make it. Yeah, right, okay. But I got, I got permission to leave. Well, unfortunately, when I left, now the United States is uh, knocking on your door. So uh, I waited until they decided that I was not the right material Excuse me. Really? So <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, we'll call you. If anybody attacks, we may need you. Other than that, get out of here. So then I started the band. I started the Rascals. I asked a bunch of fellows who basically were backing up uh, Joey D uh, uh, if they would like to go out and try it on our own. Interestingly enough, the drummer that we had said, nah, I don't want to do it. I'm going to join a local group. But this lady that I was seeing told me about this drummer. You know, and I, I've said this story before, but she was a bank teller. So when I asked her, what do you think of our band? She said, eh. I said, what do you mean, ah? <laughs> what do you know? You know dollars and bills. 
She says, well, I know a drummer. And she took me to the Metropole in New York City and I saw this fellow by the name of Dino Donnelly. Forget oh. it. Forget it. I saw this guy, he was not only, he was not only playing drums, but he was my waiter did that the other night at the Martini Bar. Is that him? Yeah, it was pretty good. Well, unfortunately, not everybody you know, can make a living these days. But anyway, he uh, became one of the rascals. And, and seriously, we had, we had a deal in six months. Nice. Six months from the inception. Wow. Yeah. I'm proud of that. And then I asked Mark and I asked Mickey, where were you when, well, I know uh, Not Gonna Eat I can Eat My Heart Anymore was a right. single, but then Good Lovin' hit number one. Where were you when that happened, and what was your Actually, experience? we were in California. We went out there to the Whiskey of Go-Go. Guys, remember the whiskey? See, because we, uh, we had to, in those days, you had to unite the country, just like today, to unite the country for a hit. In other words, you have a hit on the East Coast. That's okay, but you also have to have it on the West Coast. So we went out there and played the whiskey, and that, that's when it hit number one. I remember the whiskey. I spent two years there one night. <laughs> oh, you guys, let me tell you something. If, if any of you ever saw California in the 60s, let me tell you. Let me tell you, Los Angeles was berserk. I mean, you know, they, they, you know, they were dancing by themselves in the street, just spinning around, and it was like, do you remember the, that, what was that place they had the, I don't remember the clubs there. It was like, you know, when my, the trip, the club was called The Trip. And it was. And so seriously, one night we had guys come in, like we had Superman come in one night, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, they come in and they try to put the pin on him and he said, oh, this is Krypton, you can't put it on my... <laughs> California, man, let me tell you, you guys were pretty nuts out there. <laughs> you know? Fantastic stuff. It was great for guys from New York and New Jersey, you know, what the hell was going on, you know? But it was Peter fun. Want to get to you, because you, you were the younger, younger of the people in, in that day and age that were trying to get into music. You were hanging around older guys. Liverpool, I'm giving you the, the young guy yeah. situation. <laughs> Liverpool, Manchester, London. What, what was it like for, to be the young guy to try to get into the music business, and was that well, your goal? It was actually a really, a really good position to be in, because I was very... Um, um, I was kind of insinu I was insistent. You were and, like 15, and, so, right? So, and luckily, I was friends with with a lot of people in bands that had made it in, in different levels. You know, like I knew Johnny Kidd and the Pirates and, and some of that period. And I, obviously I knew all the Liverpool guys because I was in that scene. And, and in those days, um, it was good to have friends. You know, uh, I couldn't get Brian Epstein to manage me because he had Tommy Quickly, who was better than me. <laughs> so, um, I, I hung around, you know, and basically in those days, you needed a job if you wanted to be a musician. So everybody in Herman's Hermits um, w had a job so that they could play at night because there was not enough money for a new band to live. So I was a window cleaner and Eric Burden was a window cleaner. And uh, Eric Burden was so good that he could jump the ladder. Wow. You know, I, I had to go like up the ladder, clean the windows, go down the ladder, and then get move it along a bit, and then get through those, and then they go up the ladder, and he could, he was a little fella as well. He was a little midget kind of guy, <laughs> and he could go. Oh, he'd just go to the next ladder, or just move it over. Shit, how do you do that, man? You, you, when you've been working here for 20 years, you be able to do that, you fuck bloody kids. <laughs> and. You know, he's always a he was always a grumpy old man, but I knew all these people, and he was a grumpy old man when he was 18. <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's, you and Van Morrison, like, own the grumpy old man forever. <laughs> you know, I told Van this, but I said, did you hear that joke? Oh, somebody's, that's my phone talking Sorry, to me, excuse me. You got, you got so I, I said, you know, it's a joke. I wrote a joke, and I said, isn't it? Interesting how so many people named their children after the place they were conceived, like Paris, Hilton, and Athens, and Brooklyn, this one, and Van Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't laugh. What kind of a joke is that? <laughs> what kind of a joke is that? 
I don't, I think it's a very good one. I mean, it just happens to be, have your name in it. We all worked hard. I was a window cleaner and I sold newspapers and everything so that we could play. And we, we got lucky because we, we got to play. They had a thing at the cavern called the Junior Cavern where, you know, 12, 30, in, in those days, 12 or 13 year old people were safe to go out on their own and in a club, there were no drugs. The guy at the door was, was new. It was better than cops would have local like wrestlers on the door because they could spot trouble before it got inside. And, and so we'd play this cavern thing and it was, you know, it was the Mersey Beats and the Escorts and, and the Undertakers, people who, people who appealed to a younger audience, really. Then, and and in, in the evening, it would... Um, our dream was that if we can ever play the, like, the older people at the cavern, how do we do that? So everybody was unique and different. The Undertakers weren't like the Mersey Beats, and the Mersey Beats weren't like the Stones, and everyone was different, and everyone was trying to find a little pocket. And, and Peter Asher said it in, the, in, in his introduction of me the other night, that, that we, the only way we could get arrested was to do songs that no one else did, because basically we couldn't do Roll Over Beethoven because the Beatles did that, and they did it really well. And if we worked for about five years, we wouldn't be able to still, wouldn't be as good as them at that. So we went looking for odd songs like Henry VIII, and, mm -hmm. and we used to do Leaning on a Lamp Post, and, and Mrs. Brown, You Got a Lovely Daughter, and we used to do My Boy Lollipop, because none of those guys, none of those guys would have a go at my boy lollipop because they go that. <laughs> yeah. Is it, you For know, good reason. What? What are you? <laughs> what? Uh, you 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 singing my boy lollipop? And Bob Waller would say. So we, uh, for some reason, I was the youngest. I was about fourteen, but I was kind of running the band, the financial part of the band, which which stopped me from being one of those child stars anyway, because. If you're a child star, you usually got somebody books all your stuff and says, it's time for you to go to the bathroom and all that stuff. So I didn't have any of that. I was like, sometimes I was the driver of the van because everybody else was too drunk. And I couldn't even buy a drink. So, so I managed this thing and I, I'd go, you go to Bob Waller who was the boss of the cavern and there was this Bob Waller and this other guy, I can't remember the names now. And, and, I, and, it, and I'd say, can we have the, he said, how much were you getting? I said, uh, 30 pounds. You know, but make it up. I think we were, we, he said, I'm only going to give you 20. I go, why? He said, well, people were dancing. I said, of course people were dancing. He said, well, if people are dancing, I just need to play a bloody record. What do I need you for? <laughs> wow. So all those bands from the cavern at the time had to become entertainers. You couldn't just be a jukebox band. Even though you got all these songs that you need. Everybody did Fortune Teller. Everybody did Reeling and Rocking. I mean, the Beatles did Reeling and Rocking in Hamburg. People said they did 12, you know, 12 shows a day. One of the shows was Reeling and Rocking. And it, one o'clock came around three or four times. It's five o'clock and the place was packed. Doom, 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 doom. It'd go right back around to being five o'clock again before they'd finished the song. They would go round and round that clock and just because everyone was drunk and then stoned. So anyway, we, we built a set list, and as always happens, in 1963-64. So in 1963 was like a watershed moment. I'm with this guy called Alan Wrigley, and he's a bass player. And he, he's in and out of prison, but he's a bass player. <laughs> <laughs> so we have him in the band, and... Um, we're, we're, we're practicing at my grandmother's house, and we can hear some guitar tuning up a guitar. Who, who's listening? It's really loud. So we cross this field, and we. Cr this is, sounds like a movie, doesn't it? We cross this field, and there's, we go through a thing, and we go across another, thing, and there in the middle of the fields is the Beatles setting up on a stage, and we, they're practicing. And he, and he goes, and one, two, three. So it was obviously a sound check, but we didn't know that they didn't need to practice one, two, three. So we, we, we're watching this guy, and, and they start to play. They start to play, you know, they're going, you know what? And this guy with me goes, we're f <laughs> I'm sorry to swear, but that's exactly what happened. And <laughs> he quit the band. 
and, 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 so they, he's an architect. He's an I actual. Think. Yeah. <laughs> no, he went back to jail. But <laughs> he, he's watching. He's watching, and, and Paul McCartney comes up. He goes, "The bass player's going to sink." <laughs> no one had ever seen a bass player who sung before. There was a singer, and there were lads behind. And until then, it was like John Lennon. And these men with him, you know, were all very good. He was the lead singer, completely lead singer, and no one else. They were all going, yeah, 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 boy, you know. <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't lead singers at all. Paul McCartney was definitely the bass player, and a very, very good bass player. But suddenly he comes, there were bells on it. I almost quit. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, so it, it all starts like that. It's that, that you, we're talking about the beginning, so... It was such a, 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 a mind-blowing experience because we'd seen all the Gene Pitneys and the Jackie Wilsons and the, and the Roy Orbisons, everybody who'd bothered to tour England, we'd been to see them. But here was this fully, fully compact package of, you know, there were no trombones, no girl singers, no fluff all around it, but they captured everybody's attention and they got it all in a little van. Mm. <laughs> See, you, know you couldn't, I mean? you couldn't quit the band because you had my boy Lollipop in your back pocket. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I like I that. I don't think it was out yet, but that's okay. But so, so, so that was it. And then we created our own little... We went to look for a name that didn't make us sound like we wanted to be teen idols. We, we thought, let's call ourselves Hubert and the, you know, and, and, and this guy, we, we ended up with the name Herman and the Hermits because we thought no girls will ever scream Herman, <laughs> right? I mean, we yeah. truly believed that. And because we were afraid to be like Billy Fury and, and end yeah, up with sure. that, you know, we didn't want that, any of that because somebody who did that really much better than us, Billy Fury, Conway Twitty, all had that good. So we chose to be like, kind of a little bit sissy <laughs> and likable. Young girls would like us, you know, and a lot of this. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and bit by bit, we created a following. It started with Margaret, who would sit on the front of the stage at every show at the cabin like this. She would always be there like, <laughs> All I know is her name was Margaret. I know nothing about her. I hope she's still alive, but a poor girl. And she, we started with Margaret, and then there was some other girls came, and, you know, bit by bit, people stopped not looking at the band. You know, when you first start, some people are just disinterested, you know. Oh, yeah. but bit by bit, we had more and more people looking, and we put a show together, and we had a load of songs, and we got a set list. And then we were the only band in the neighborhood who didn't have a record deal. So when they send those scouts, you've got Freddie and the Dreamers, Wayne Fontana, the Mersey Beats, the Undertakers, they've all got records that are absolutely phenomenal bands. And I know all the people in all the bands and the Mojos was this fantastic band, a little bit like your band, by the way. They played sort of more soulful, the Mojos, anyway. Everything's all right, everything's all right. It was just a fantastic record. It wasn't a hit. Well, what's going on? So we come along, when this guy called Mickey Most um, comes down to, we were playing in the, the beach coma uh, in Bolton. We played there every week. You know, it was like a place where we went. And we said, there's this famous producer coming down. So when we go on stage, we want you all to scream and make a fuss over us. Because that never works, because they scream in all the wrong places. But when, <laughs> when it's set up, you know, you, do, you think you're going to scream, and then they go, ah! And they go, oh, Jesus. So we're, we're dying on this thing. But, so he comes, and he says, the magic words, uh, I'd like to sign the boy, not the band. Mm -hmm. And I go, you know, I, I go... That's it, we can't, he can't produce us. So I said, well, let us come down and make, do an audition. Because these boys in my band have given up their careers to be in my band. So I'm not gonna, I'm, I don't care if I never have a hit, I'm not gonna dump them. So, so we go, we, <laughs> so we go in the studio, <laughs> we go in the studio, <laughs> and we record this track, and he says, you, come in here, come in here. He says, listen to this. 
So it's got, it solos the drum track. I said, you can't, you can't have a record with him on it. I said, so what are we gonna do? He said, well, how about you get another drummer? <laughs> keep this one and keep this one. He, that guitar player isn't a very good guitar player. Let him play the bass, as if the bass is easier than the guitar, right? <laughs> So suddenly we're switching all the people around, and you know, we're breaking, breaking hearts, man. I mean, breaking hearts. People who, I say, you can't, you can't be in the band anymore because, well, why not? Well, because there's a requirement on a recording is to be able to play in time. And we didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know that you couldn't play in time. Maybe, you know, I once said to Charlie Watts, when you did, when you recorded Come On, why did you play it so fast? You didn't do it fast like that on stage. He said, we were probably frightened. <laughs> well, we are, we we are, we've blown through an hour. I can't believe it, but I just, before we well, end up- Well, let's stay a bit longer. We've got yeah. nothing else to do. We stuck on the boat. I want to know- Go one more time through here. I'd like to hear the rest of their stories. Just want to hear your, your sentence of, of what it, the biggest moment in your career once you were on that roller coaster. Start with Mark. Uh, when, when Ed Sullivan poked his head in the dressing room and said, you boys okay? <laughs> and he was worried because the, the, um, Jim Morrison and, the, and the, the guys had been on a couple weeks before, and you know what happened they with, sang with higher, that. sang higher, right. Yeah, so he, he said, you're, you're going to be okay, right? No, like, oh. no dirty lyrics? We went, yeah, but it was Ed Sullivan. And, you know, Ed Sullivan, when you were on Sullivan, you had made it. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, well-deserved. Well